Hi, it's Katrina. Ever wondered what life was like for our earliest ancestors? Today we are diving deep into the past to explore some of the oldest structures built by extinct species of humans. From hidden caves untouched for millennia to ancient homes, today I'll uncover the roots of civilization itself, structures that still hold the key to our mysterious past. So be sure to subscribe and let's go! Before the age of humans, what if the first architects on Earth weren't human? Archaeologists unearthed a wooden structure in Zambia that is nearly 500,000 years old. That predates modern humans by over 100,000 years. Although it's been disproven over and over again, many people still hold the belief that the hominids that existed before Homo sapiens were primitive and lived nomadic lifestyles. But this discovery changes all that. This wooden structure was found near Zambia's Colombo Falls over 50 years ago. At the time, scientists didn't think wood could survive for so long without rotting away. To them, it was impossible that the material could last almost half a million years. But after years of diligent research and special luminescence analysis, the true age of the site was finally revealed in late 2023. Turns out the wood somehow became waterlogged, preserving the construction material for hundreds of thousands of years. It was essentially pickled and preserved for us to find. Some of the oldest Homo sapien fossils in the world date back roughly 300,000 years. So what does that mean? Well, it means there is no way that modern humans could have created the structure. So if it wasn't us, then who was it? The answer to that question is still a bit blurry, but the most likely candidate is Homo heidelbergensis. This is a now extinct species of human that appeared about 600,000 years ago. These hominids lived around the same time and occupied the region where the structure was built. Aside from the remnants of the structure, researchers also uncovered four wooden tools at the site. At least that's what they think they are. Among these so-called tools was a cut log, a notched branch, a wedge, and a digging stick. According to the lead author of the study, Larry Barham, from the University of Liverpool, the people who created the structure were creative and intelligent. They used their imagination to build something they'd never seen before, something that may not have previously existed. And that's a big deal. I mean, can you come up with an architectural style or invention right now off the top of your head that's never been done? Maybe, but it's pretty difficult to do. The remnants of the structure comprise two logs with notches that could have allowed the logs to fit together. The size of these logs suggests to researchers that the builders were making something substantial. The smaller log was five feet long, while the other measured slightly larger. It's unlikely to have been a permanent dwelling of some kind, but it is possible that it formed one part of a platform for a shelter. A member of the research team, Geoff Dooler, proposed that it might be some kind of wooden setup, like a primitive dock, for sitting by the river and fishing. But what do you think it could have been? Let me know in the comments down below! The Great Ziggurat of Ur If you stepped back in time to ancient Mesopotamia, you would find a city that stood out as a marvel of engineering and religious devotion. The City of Ur this place thrived during the 3rd millennium BC and boasted some of the most impressive architecture of the ancient world, most notably the Great Ziggurat of Ur. King Shulgi, who ruled for an impressive 48 years, turned Ur into the capital of a vast empire. Finishing what his father had started, it was under his reign that the ziggurat was completed. To unify his diverse subjects, he declared himself a god leveraging his divine status to consolidate power. He was also a patron of the arts, commissioning works that celebrated his achievements in hunting, warfare, and music. However, after Shulgi's death, Ur began to decline. His successors struggled to maintain control, leading to the city's eventual sacking by the Elamites. The once great city fell into obscurity, especially after the Euphrates River shifted its course in the 4th century BC. 
This shift left Ur without irrigation, leading to its abandonment. The Great Ziggurat, located in what is now Iraq's Dikar province, was a colossal step pyramid that soared to an estimated height of 100 feet. Though only the foundations remain today, the ziggurat once measured 210 feet long and 151 feet wide. Its construction began under King Ur-Namu and was completed by his son, King Shulgi. This grand structure was dedicated to Nana, the moon god and patron deity of Ur. But the ziggurat was more than just a temple. It symbolized the divine mountain homes of Mesopotamian gods and was believed to be the earthly residence of Nana. In the 19th century, European explorers rediscovered Ur and the Great Ziggurat, sparking a wave of archaeological interest. Excavations unearthed the remains of this ancient wonder, and restoration efforts have since aimed to restore it to its former glory. Denisova Cave There is a cave in Siberia that may have once hosted three different human species at the same time. But wait, didn't modern humans evolve after Neanderthals went extinct? Not exactly. There is evidence to suggest that Neanderthals never really disappeared. In fact, you could have Neanderthal DNA coursing through your veins right now and not even know it. This incredible discovery began over a decade ago when anthropologists unearthed a pinky bone fossil from a group of extinct humans, who at the time were completely unknown. They found the fossil in Denisova Cave, which is famous today for housing some of the oldest artifacts ever found. This unknown group was named Denisovans, after the cave they occupied. Then, after researchers analyzed some DNA found in the cave soil, they made a shocking discovery. Not only did Denisovans live here, but so did Neanderthals, alongside modern humans. For at least 300,000 years, these three human species occupied this space, with different groups using the cave at certain points in time with some overlap. First came the Denisovans, then the Neanderthals showed up around 170,000 years ago, and modern humans showed up late to the party and were the last to arrive on the scene some 45,000 years ago. And guess what? These groups didn't just coexist, they combined their DNA, if you catch my drift. That's right, a total of eight human fossils were uncovered in the cave, including a bone from a child with one Denisovan and one Neanderthal parent. And if they got together, who's to say they didn't breed with modern humans as well? Researchers also recovered jewelry and sophisticated stone tools. They even found a 50,000-year-old tiara made from woolly mammoth ivory, suggesting that there might have been some type of hierarchy within the cave. Was there a king or a queen who ruled this place? Nobody can say for sure. But what do you think? Collaborating with another group of experts who had already dated the layers of the cave, the researchers collected 728 soil samples. After spending two years analyzing the samples where they separated and sequenced the DNA, they discovered human DNA in 175 of them. According to scientist Katerina Duca, this makes it the largest and most thorough study of its kind. And now for a quick break because it's shout out time. I want to give a big thank you to Earl Francart and Michael Bless Schmidt for supporting this channel. We wouldn't be here without you. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family. The Bosnian Pyramids The ancient Egyptians may have thought they were the masters of pyramid building, but they were vastly outdone by a civilization that existed thousands of years before them. The Great Pyramids of Egypt are nowhere near the biggest or the oldest pyramids in the world. In fact, they pale in comparison to the Pyramid of the Moon in Bosnia. It dates back some 12,000 years, predating the Egyptian pyramids by at least 8,000 years. But at that time, most of Europe was buried under a layer of ice a mile thick. So who could have possibly constructed this architectural masterpiece? The Pyramid of the Moon isn't the only pyramid in the country. There are actually two others in the city of Visoko and another two nearby. The one in Visoko is the tallest, standing 722 feet high. It's called the Pyramid of the Sun, or Visosika Hill. The third has been named the Pyramid of Love. According to Sam Osmanagich, an amateur archaeologist, these structures make up the greatest pyramidal complex ever built on the face of the Earth. Move aside, Egypt, you are old news. But let's back up a bit. Osmanagich is no expert. 
Sure, he has an interest in archaeology and has written several books, but he was never properly trained in the field. We should take everything he says with a grain of salt. I'll say this, though. The guy is pretty convincing. In April of 2005, Osmanagic was invited to a local museum in Visoko to promote his books. While he was there, he took a trip to the summit of Visosika Hill. This peak is littered with the ruins of Visokia, a seat of power for some of Bosnia's medieval kings. Yes, I know that these names all sound extremely similar. While at the top of Visosika Hill, Osmanagic couldn't help but notice that the hill was shaped like a pyramid. And when he looked across the valley, he saw another hill with a similar shape. It had a flat top and three triangular sides. That hill in the distance is now known as the Pyramid of the Moon. The man then consulted a compass and concluded that the sides of the pyramid were perfectly aligned with the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. To him, there was no way the structures were just the work of Mother Nature. After securing some digging permits from the authorities, Osmanagic collected some samples and wrote his latest book, The Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun. He also established a non-profit foundation, the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun Foundation, which helped him seek investors to fund an excavation at the site. What he found was layers of fractured conglomerate as well as cracked plates of sandstone separated by more layers of clay and silt. According to geologists Robert Scotch and Paul Heinrich, these findings are pretty mundane, nothing out of the ordinary. They say that these types of landforms are called flat irons in the US, and they are seen a lot out west. Heinrich says there are hundreds of them around the world, but they have no particular significance. Osmanagic, of course, disagrees. He believes that the blocks he found were actually made of concrete that had been poured by the ancient builders of the site. Today, thanks to Osmanagic, it's a common belief for Bosniaks that their ancestors were master architects who may have been even more advanced than the ancient Egyptians. They also think that Visoko was a cradle of European civilization. These beliefs have only been solidified in recent years thanks to new findings at the site. Osmanagic says he also has discovered a series of ancient tunnels that connect the three pyramids of Visoko. The problem is that no one has been able to verify this. If this is actually a pyramid, the true architects are a mystery. But Osmanagic thinks it could have been the Illyrians, a group of people who occupied the Balkan Peninsula before 600 AD, when Slavic tribes conquered it. Not much is known about the Illyrians, but it is possible that they were part of a sophisticated civilization. Maybe they were so advanced that a mile of ice didn't stop them from constructing the largest pyramids on the planet. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. The Mystery of the Long Yu Caves Imagine stumbling upon a secret world hidden beneath your feet. An ancient labyrinth carved into the earth, its purpose and creators lost to time. This is the story of the Long Yu Caves, a complex of 24 mysterious man-made caverns carved deep into the sandstone of Feng Huang Hill in China. Discovered purely by chance in 1992 when local farmers drained a series of ponds, these caves revealed an astonishing underground wonder that has baffled experts ever since. The five largest caverns are completely independent from one another. They are massive, with heights reaching up to 66 feet. They are full of intricate shapes featuring curved walls and ceilings marked with strange, uneven imprints. When news of this discovery spread, some believed the caves were a natural phenomenon. But further study revealed that these caverns were deliberately made with only one entrance each. They are complete with vertical shafts and stairwells carved from stone, allowing water to flow into the caves. Ingeniously designed drainage systems were also found, showing that a lot of thought went into managing the water levels inside. Aligned from south to southwest, the caverns were positioned to maximize sunlight, illuminating the interiors. Their sloping sidewalls reduced stress on the ceilings, preventing collapse. The precision and complexity of the caves suggest that they were carved layer by layer from top to bottom. The architects used short chisels, some of which were actually found in one of the larger caverns. But the big questions remain. Who created these caves? When were they made? And why? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Archaeologists and scholars have been scratching their heads since the discovery of the caves, but answers are hard to come by. Few historical records exist, and the only hint comes from a 17th-century poem by Yu Shun, a Chinese poet. 
glazed clay pots recovered from the cave floors dating back to the Western Han Dynasty between 206 BC and 23 AD suggest that the caves are at least 2,000 years old. But for all anyone knows, they could be much, much older. The true purpose of the Longyu Caves is still up for debate. Were they quarries, mausoleums, palaces, sites for religious ceremonies, or luxury hotels? Each theory is possible, but none of them can be confirmed without more evidence. The Great Dam of Marib A dam that stood for hundreds of years was taken down by an unlikely foe. Rats! At least that's what local legends say. The Great Dam of Marib played a vital role in storing water and supporting agriculture in the Arabian Peninsula for centuries. It served as a lifeline for the ancient Sabaean kingdom. But then came the rodents. Constructed around the 8th or 7th century BC, the dam is traditionally attributed to a ruler named Suhu Alai Yanuf and his son, Yatha Amar Bayin. However, archaeological evidence suggests that the structure went through several phases of development between the 2nd and 1st millennium BC. The Sabaeans were a Semitic people who migrated to southern Arabia. They relied heavily on this dam to sustain their civilization, which thrived due to its strategic location on the spice trade route. The dam was a marvel of ancient engineering, consisting of a massive earthen wall reinforced with stone and gravel, topped by huge stone foundations. The structure stood about 50 feet tall and spanned 2,362 feet across the Dana Valley. The dam effectively prevented floods and stored water for agricultural use. Sliding gates on either end redirected the water into an irrigation system, turning the arid landscape into fertile land. This was crucial for the survival of the Sabaean people. You can't grow food in the desert, but these people figured out how. Over the centuries, the Marib Dam was repaired and maintained even after the Sabaean Kingdom fell to the Himyarites. But in 570 AD, the dam broke for the final time. The exact cause of its collapse is debated. Some believe it was due to an earthquake or heavy rains, while local legends amusingly blame large rats for gnawing at the base. But could rats really do that much damage? Let me know what you think. Today, all that remains of the Marib Dam are its sliding gates. But unfortunately, these remnants were further damaged in 2015 due to airstrikes during Yemen's ongoing conflict. Lava Tube Houses Imagine a world without air conditioning. How would you cope with the relentless summer sun? When people wanted to beat the heat thousands of years ago, what do you think they did? Did they jump in the nearest body of water or migrate up north? Maybe. But they also went underground, traveling through subterranean tunnels carved by molten lava millions of years prior. Archaeologists have discovered that starting in the Stone Age, Neolithic herders journeyed into and inhabited these extensive tunnels called lava tubes. The colder air below the surface likely provided ancient people a break from the relentless summer sun and brutal wind. For thousands of years, they sheltered in these tunnels with their livestock. When it was time to leave, herders left some objects behind. They even etched images on the stone walls, leaving their mark for future generations to find. In the Harat Kaibar lava field in Saudi Arabia, there is a tunnel system called Um Jirsan. It's the longest in the region, spanning nearly one mile. It is full of passages that branch off like the roots of a tree, some of which are 39 feet tall and as wide as 148 feet. The age of the lava that created this subterranean system has yet to be confirmed. But in 2007, a study estimated that it was about 3 million years old. Animal bones were recently found by archaeologists working at Umjir San. Some of the bones date back over 4,000 years, but others are as recent as 400 years old. Researchers also uncovered human remains, with the oldest dating to 6,000 years ago. Dozens of stone tools, pieces of carved wood, and cloth fragments were discovered among the animal and human bones. These artifacts provide evidence that human occupation began in these tunnels at least 7,000 years ago. However, compared to other ancient sites where humans lived, the archaeological material found at Um Jirsan was quite scarce. To researchers, this suggests that these underground tunnels were used more as temporary refuges and not permanent living spaces. You can think of these lava tubes as emergency shelters for Neolithic people. 
Nearby, in another tunnel, archaeologists discovered 16 panels of rock art. Some of the images featured family portraits, humans alongside domesticated animals like cattle, sheep, goats, and dogs. The humans were drawn like stick figures and were holding tools. Other pictures appeared to show animals with large, arching horns, like the horns of an ibex. However, they could have represented a specific type of goat. Nobody is really sure. The varnish coating on these carvings hints that they date back to sometime between 4500 and 3500 BC, during the Chalcolithic period. And if that's the case, the images predate the rise of the Bronze Age. Our subterranean cousins. So easy, a caveman can do it. Remember that Geico commercial? Were they poking fun at our ancient ancestors? I think so. Everyone used to make fun of Neanderthals. Until recently, Neanderthals and cave people were the same thing, simple and dumb. When you think of Neanderthals, do you picture them as skilled builders? Probably not. But a discovery in France completely changed what we thought they were capable of. About 176,000 years ago, long before modern humans evolved, Neanderthals ventured underground, where they built complex and mysterious structures. They were smart, they were organized, and according to archaeologists, they may have even been religious. Since Neanderthals were first discovered in the 1800s, archaeologists have argued about how advanced they really were. They believe Neanderthals built shelters, but no well-preserved ruins of these shelters have been found. Obviously. I mean, organic material usually disappears pretty quickly. The only remains of Neanderthal structures are debated and are no more than 50,000 years old. But this study from France, published in Nature magazine, is the first to examine well-preserved structures built by early Neanderthals. These structures are so complex that they look like those made by modern humans. This supports the idea that Neanderthals were intelligent and had some behaviors similar to Homo sapiens. Neanderthals are some of our closest extinct human relatives. They lived in Europe and parts of Asia from about 400,000 to 40,000 years ago before being replaced by Homo sapiens, aka us. For a long time, archaeologists thought of Neanderthals as not very advanced, but these recent discoveries are changing that view. We now know that Neanderthals used fire, made complex tools, wore clothes, and were skilled hunters. However, very few of the tools and artifacts they made have been found, and some are in pretty rough shape. This makes it difficult for archaeologists to learn much about these early humans. It also turns out that Neanderthals used light. The study's findings suggest a high level of sophistication, according to Brian Hayden, a Neanderthal expert. He says that Neanderthals would have required some kind of lighting apparatus in order to venture deep into a subterranean cave. There is no way they were just wandering around in the dark. The action of exploring underground in itself requires forethought, planning, and organizational skills. The researchers talk about several structures found deep inside Brunichel Cave in southwestern France. The site was discovered in 1990 but wasn't fully studied until 2013. These ancient structures are made of more than 400 pieces of stalagmites, all about the same size, stacked and arranged in two circles. Researchers found evidence of fire on the structures, along with burned bone fragments. By studying the stalagmites and the calcite that formed on them, the team determined that the site is about 176,500 years old. At that time, only Neanderthals lived in Europe, meaning that no other group of humans could have been responsible. What's really interesting about these structures is the mystery of why they were made. Since they were deep inside a dark cave, they couldn't have been the base for a hut. For some, like Brian Hayden, this suggests that the structures had a symbolic or ritual purpose. This means that Neanderthals likely had some sense of religion. I mean, why else would anyone walk deep into a subterranean cave to set up stalagmites in complete darkness? But hey, maybe that wasn't the case at all. If you can think of any other explanations, let me hear them in the comments. Poverty Point Over 3,000 years ago, a group of indigenous people constructed the largest settlement north of Mexico at that time, entirely without farming. Today, known as Poverty Point, it stands as one of the most significant archaeological sites in history. They were hunter-gatherers who somehow managed to create massive earthen mounds and establish an extensive trade network. And get this, these people didn't have powerful leaders forcing them to build. Nope. 
They just worked together as equals, proving that you don't need a king to achieve something incredible. The name Poverty Point isn't what the original inhabitants called it. The name actually comes from a cotton plantation established on the site in the 19th century, long after the native people had moved on. We don't even know what tribe built the mounds or what they called their home. But what they left behind is mind-blowing. Archaeologists have been digging at Poverty Point since the early 20th century, and they have uncovered a lot. But the site still holds many mysteries. For example, why did the American Indians build these giant mounds? Louisiana is dotted with ancient earthen mounds, some as old as 6,000 years. But Poverty Point's mounds are among the largest. Mound A, for instance, is the second largest pre-colonial earthen mound in the United States. The people at Poverty Point moved 27 million cubic feet of dirt by hand to build five huge mounds, six ridges, and a big plaza. To put that into perspective for you, that's enough dirt to fill almost 300 Olympic-sized swimming pools. The site was ideally located on Macon Ridge, overlooking the Mississippi River floodplain. This elevated spot stayed dry during floods, giving the people easy access to resources like deer, fish, nuts, and berries. But there was a catch. There was no nearby source of stone, which is a key material for making tools. Somehow, the people of Poverty Point imported around 78 tons of exotic stone from up to 700 miles away. That's like the weight of 10 school buses. But how did they get the stone? Did they trade for it? Did visitors bring it? No one knows for sure. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. The imported stone was used to create everything from tools to beads to spear points. One of the coolest artifacts found is the Poverty Point objects, or the PPOs, clay balls used for cooking since there wasn't enough stone around. These little clay balls are unique to Poverty Point, just like the site itself, which remains a mystery and a marvel of ancient engineering. The Menga Dolmen Researchers have uncovered an ancient marble that will make you rethink everything you thought you knew about prehistoric engineering. It is a colossal stone tomb called the Menga Dolmen that is shaking up our understanding of Neolithic construction. A study published in Science Advances Journal in 2024 revealed that the builders of the Menga Dolmen weren't just using primitive methods. They were actually employing advanced engineering techniques and scientific principles almost 6,000 years ago. This challenges the old belief that Neolithic societies lacked sophistication in their building practices. The Menga Dolmen, constructed between 3800 and 3600 BC, was found in Antequera, Spain. It's a massive structure from the Neolithic era, predating Egypt's oldest pyramid by about a thousand years. Researchers have long been captivated by its size and complexity, sparking a decade-long investigation into how such a grand structure was built so long ago. With 32 enormous stones weighing a total of around 1,140 tons, this dolmen is a jaw-dropping example of early monumental architecture. The stones make up the walls and roof of the dolmen, as well as the pillars holding the roof in place. Previously, it was thought that the massive stones or the orthostats were moved into place using ramps. But the new research reveals a different story. Instead of using ramps, the dolmen was built from the inside out. What does that mean? Did the ancient builders come from inner earth? Was this dolmen not a final resting place, but an exit? The capstones, some weighing up to 150 tons, were transported using sleds on a specially prepared trackway designed to minimize friction and protect the stones from damage. This method shows an expert understanding of basic physical principles like friction and geometry. One of the most fascinating aspects of the dolmen is its design. Among the capstones is a particularly hefty one known as number five, which features an arch carved into its surface. This arch is the oldest known stress relief arch in the world. It demonstrates that the builders were already thinking about how to manage weight distribution and ensure that the structure would last. The researchers also found that the stones were placed with incredible precision, with millimeter scale adjustments that created a trapezoidal effect for added stability. Are you impressed? Beneath the Sea of Galilee 
There is a massive mysterious structure lying deep beneath the Sea of Galilee, and it is larger than the length of a Boeing 747. It was discovered by accident in 2003 when scientists were scanning the lake floor. However, this submerged marvel wasn't fully examined until recently. Shmuel Marco, a geophysicist from Tel Aviv University, was astonished when he first saw it. According to him, he and his team just happened to bump into it. The lake bed, which is usually smooth, revealed this giant mound. It didn't seem significant at first until experts realized it resembled an enormous Bronze Age statue. So what is this thing? It is a massive cone-shaped formation made of basalt rocks stretching 230 feet across and rising 32 feet high. It's twice as big as Stonehenge, weighing an estimated 60,000 tons. The size of the structure and its location underwater suggests that it might have been used as an ancient fish nursery. However, some archaeologists think it was built on land and was later submerged as the lake's water level rose. Finding the truth here is crucial in order for scientists to understand the history of the lake. Lead archaeologist Yitzhak Paz notes that the underwater setting makes studying the site especially challenging. It would be easy to dig up the site if it was on land, but underwater excavation is expensive and hard. The structure's exact age is a mystery, but estimates range from 2,000 to 12,000 years old. These calculations are based on comparisons to other local sites, as well as the sand buildup around this particular structure. The site may have also been used for ceremonies or burials. It is so unusual and massive that it could have been a ramp with statues or a ceremonial structure for rituals. But it's all up in the air right now. Nobody has the answers. One thing is clear though, the structure was of great importance to its creators. Marco points out that the effort involved in transporting and arranging the massive stones is evidence of an advanced society, one capable of impressive planning and again, organization. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Underground Masada A team of archaeologists from Tel Aviv University began excavations at an unexplored part of a desert mountain fortress in 2017. The fortress is called Masada, and it was once a grand palace built by Herod the Great, although it's more famous for the tragic deaths of 960 Jewish rebels in 74 AD. When the Romans came to Israel to slaughter the Jewish people, rebels escaped to Masada in hopes of surviving. But when the Romans began marching to the fortress to take them as prisoners or kill them, all 960 rebels and their families jumped off the edge of the cliff in a last act of defiance. What the researchers were interested in was a mysterious underground structure. The structure was originally detected as early as 1924 during an aerial survey of the site, but it's never been physically explored. No one knows what the mysterious structure was used for, although experts believe it may have been a hiding spot for the rebels during the siege. But here is where things get really mysterious. The team from the university announced that they would be exploring the subterranean structure in 2017. That was five years ago. Since then, we haven't heard a peep from them. We have to assume the excavations have already wrapped up, and yet they haven't announced a single thing. We don't know what they found down there, and the underground structure is still a mystery. Balan Canche Near the ancient Maya city of Chichen Itza, there is a dark and mysterious cave called Balan Canche. The sacred cave was once used for mysterious rituals. It was an extremely important place to the Maya people for hundreds of years, up until their entire civilization collapsed. To understand why this cave was so important, we need to look at the belief system of the Maya. They believed the universe was divided into three major parts. There's the sky, the earth, and the underworld. For the Maya people, the underworld was accessible through certain caves that functioned as magical gateways. These gateways were deep underground and could allow for travel into the realm known as Shibalba, ruled by the Maya death gods and their helpers. One of these caves was Balan Canche, about 1.2 miles of passages through hard limestone rock. 1,000 years ago, the water table was about 18 feet lower than it is now, meaning the Maya would have ventured far deeper into the system than anyone can today. 
This was such an important place that the Maya built structures all around the entrance of the cave, although they were sadly demolished sometime during the 1950s and used as road fill. In ancient times, the creepy cave was connected directly to Chichen Itza via a paved road, another indication that it was extremely important. The Death Valley Secret City There might just be a secret subterranean city hiding underneath the salt flats of Death Valley. The average temperature in Death Valley is typically over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, while water is a thing of fantasy and vegetation is scarce. It really is a valley of death, a place where a person could easily die from dehydration if they wander too long and too far. And yet underneath California's Great Valley of Salt is supposedly an underground city. Its roots can be found in Native American lore, with the legend of Sheen Al Av. The Paiute legend says that Sheen Al Av was an underground city accessible through a labyrinth of underground tunnels beneath Death Valley. To reach this place, one needed to embark on a perilous journey to cross into the spirit lands, where thousands of dead people all lived happily in a great and shining city. It sounds like nonsense, and yet there could be some truth to it. There probably isn't a city of dead souls, but there may be a physical city constructed by a lost civilization. In 1931, physician Bruce Russell and his friend, Dr. Daniel Bovey, allegedly discovered a maze of catacombs in Death Valley while sinking a mine shaft. They told everyone about the ruins they found under the valley, but unfortunately, they could never locate the entrance again. They were laughed at and called fools, and supposedly spent the rest of their lives desperately trying to relocate the city. To this day, nobody has ever been able to find the alleged hole leading down to the ruins of Sheen Ao Av. The Pilsen Historical Underground The Pilsen Historical Underground is one of the largest networks of underground tunnels in Europe, originally dug out in the 13th century. Construction on these tunnels continued for an unfathomable 600 years, only coming to an end in the 19th century. The original purpose was for storage. The city of Pilsen in Czechia needed a place to store their goods underground, and over the years, the tunnels were used to transport water and sewage. If the name Pilsen sounds familiar, that's because it's the birthplace of Pilsner beer. People in the city began carving cellars up to three stories deep underneath their houses in the 13th century. They used these cellars for storing food and supplies, and a whole lot of tasty beer. As more and more of the underground storage facilities were built, tunnels started to be carved connecting them. Over time, it grew into a huge network, one that was used for moving sewage around. By the 19th century, Pilsen had 12 miles of subterranean passages underneath their streets. But it was right around the time the tunnels stopped being carved that they also stopped being used. They were abruptly abandoned, and many of them have since collapsed. Some sections of the underground are now tourist attractions. Many of them are filled with hidden artifacts from the Middle Ages, so you just never know what you might find down there. And now for number six. But first, I want to give a big shout out to Baby and Daniel Griffin. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button and join the family. We'd love to have you. The Grail Crypt Amateur archaeologist Barry John Bauer is convinced that a secret crypt is hidden underneath West London. He believes the subterranean chamber houses the legendary Holy Grail, the very cup Jesus Christ drank from at the Last Supper. The Holy Grail has been the most coveted Christian artifact for 2,000 years. Barry John believes that when he finds it, it will be the greatest discovery in archaeological history. But just how in the world did Barry John reach this conclusion? For years, he's been trying to track the Grail through its links to the legendary Knights Templar. He believes that many of the Knights Templar trained at a secret facility in England, in what is now Hounslow Heath. Before they went on expeditions to the Holy Land, this was where they trained their fiercest knights. He believes they also built a secret crypt to hide some of the most important relics brought back from the Crusades. They hid the relics here because their more famous bases in Jerusalem and France were not secure. Finally, Barry John believes the entrance was covered deliberately near the man-made Duke of Northumberland's River. Unfortunately, he has yet to find any physical evidence. But Barry John Bauer is still convinced and is hoping to dig up the grail any day now. 
Do you think that he could be right? Let me know in the comments below. Secret Malta Tunnels The city of Valletta is a beautiful example of ancient European architecture. This city is a grid of shining golden towers, ancient flagstones, public squares that have been around for centuries, and grand palaces. But underneath the splendor of the city's streets is a secret subterranean world, one that's been kept out of view of visitors for decades. Throughout Malta's history, the island has been occupied by just about everyone. It was a strategic center for the Crusaders. It was occupied by the Ottomans and was taken over briefly by the British Empire. Because of its position between the East and West Mediterranean, it's always been a coveted spot by those in power. Even Napoleon was there. In 1530, the Knights Hospitaller arrived on the island and built a fortified capital. This was after the Knights had failed to keep their capitals in Jerusalem and Rhodes. They'd been kicked out of both their old cities by the Ottomans and desperately wanted to hold on to the island of Malta. But the Ottomans were coming for them, and so they started digging tunnels underneath their fortress at the tip of what is today Valletta. But so too did the Ottoman invaders. And every once in a while, one side would break into the other's tunnels and fight brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat in the darkness. It was almost like trench warfare in World War I, except underground. This bizarre subterranean combat went on for nearly four months and ultimately allowed the knights to maintain control over the island. In 1566, 12 massive cisterns were built to support the citizens in case of another attack. The tunnels were fortified, and a whole network of underground battle stations were dug to prevent invasion. By the time the British took control of Malta in the middle of the 19th century, there was one of the biggest subterranean networks in the world hiding underneath the streets of Valletta. But by that time, they weren't useful anymore and fell into disrepair. Emperor Nero's Secret Chamber A mysterious underground chamber was found underneath the ancient palace of one of the most infamous emperors in Roman history. The chamber was uncovered while archaeologists were doing restorations at the Domus Aurea, once occupied by the nefarious Emperor Nero. The room was found mostly filled with dirt and rubble, but still in remarkable condition. Researchers found the walls to be covered in amazing artworks of mythical creatures, everything from sphinxes to satyrs and even centaurs. The experts are calling it the Sphinx Room and believe it was built following the Great Fire of Rome that took place in 64 AD. Emperor Nero lived in the Domus Aurea after much of Rome burnt to the ground and many citizens were left homeless. The palace had 300 rooms and took up over 300 acres. This mysterious underground chamber was covered in drawings of sea creatures, warriors, and mythical birds. It looks like it was built about four years before Nero died and shows just how lavishly the hated emperor lived. However, researchers aren't sure what the room may have been used for. What we do know is that the Domus Aurea was torn to the ground by angry Romans following the death of Nero. The Romans were still devastated by the fire, and they saw the emperor's grand estate as a slap in the face. Secret Teotihuacan Tunnel A secret tunnel was discovered in Mexico, one that scientists are saying might solve some mysteries of Teotihuacan. The discovery dates back to the fall of 2003, when a heavy rainstorm bludgeoned the ancient pyramids and other ruins at the pre-Aztec city outside Mexico City. Much of the archaeological site was flooded, sweeping away dirt and debris in a devastating torrent. But after the storm had cleared, Archaeologist Sergio Gomez arrived to discover that a sinkhole had opened near the Temple of the Plumed Serpent, one of the most famous temples at the site. Sergio didn't realize it at the time, but he was staring into the entrance of a lost underground tunnel no one had seen in centuries. When he really started to investigate, it became clear he had a major discovery on his hands. It looked as though the tunnel led directly to an undiscovered subterranean chamber underneath the heart of the temple. If his theory proved correct, Sergio was looking at the biggest discovery of his career. Many months went by, then years. The team couldn't simply start carving out the tunnel because they could damage the site. They had to create digital maps and scan the earth. They learned that the tunnel goes approximately 330 feet down to the center of the temple. They also learned that the tunnel had been intentionally sealed with huge boulders and covered up 2,000 years ago. Whatever was hiding beneath the temple 
was meant to be hidden forever. Sergio is still trying to reach the mysterious chamber at the end of the tunnel. He and his team have already found countless artifacts, obsidian knives, a sculpture of a jaguar, some corn from 1800 years ago, and much more. But because they're digging with toothbrushes so as to not miss anything, they won't reach the secret chamber at the bottom for some time. The Oldest Mosque Archaeologists have just detected a mysterious hidden feature of an old Visigothic city in Spain. They think they may have found one of the oldest mosques in Europe buried underground. Researchers haven't done any digging, but instead used geomagnetic instruments to reveal walls and the remains of structures buried beneath Recopolis. This is a rural area outside the city of Madrid, originally a powerful place founded 1400 years ago by the Visigoths who helped end the Roman Empire. Medieval historian Michael McCormick says he and his team found buried buildings, streets, and mysterious passages at every single place they surveyed. The only issue is that they can't just start digging up the streets where people live. Recopolis was founded by King Leovigild of the Visigoths in 578. This city prospered up until the Islamic conquest of 711, when the city was destroyed. It was briefly occupied by its destroyers, then abandoned around the year 800. Because Recropolis was one of the first places conquered by Islamic warriors, it was one of the first places in Europe to have a mosque. Researchers believe that they have found that mosque. They identified a building with a very different orientation from all the rest, with its entrance facing Mecca. The building's floor plan looks a lot like mosques from the Middle East. If correct, this could be the oldest mosque in Europe. The Theopetra Cave The Theopetra Cave is home to one of the oldest artificial structures in the world. It may even be the oldest structure ever crafted by human hands. It dates back to around the extinction of the Neanderthals, when prehistoric humans lived in caves across Europe. Theopetra Cave is located near Meteora in Greece, and it was inhabited about 130,000 years ago. Archaeologists have found evidence of continuous human habitation inside the cave, ending only about 6,000 years ago. In other words, both Neanderthals and Homo sapiens lived in the cave for a whopping 125,000 years. The two different species likely shared the cave at some point like prehistoric roommates. All kinds of amazing discoveries have been made within the dark confines of the cavern. Skeletons from 15,000 years ago, traces of plants and seeds, and most interesting of all, a stone wall. Scientists were able to date the wall to 23,000 years old. They did this by using an approach of dating known as optically stimulated luminescence. It was made to block off part of the entrance. Nobody knows exactly what it was used for, but it's believed it could have been intended to keep out the cold. This is now the oldest evidence in Greece of a human-made structure, and potentially one of the oldest stone walls ever made by intelligent life forms on Earth. Thanks for watching! Would you ever live in an underground lair like people from ancient times? Let me know in the comments below! And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already! See you next time! Bye!